Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Indusor Education. Um, today we will solve a couple of problems related to oscillations. Um, now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on unisor.com. And I do suggest you to watch this lecture from this website, because every lecture has very detailed notes with all the formulas derived much more nicely and properly than whatever I'm doing here at the board, um, in more details probably. And there are certain uh, verifications like checks, which I don't really do here, but I do it in the notes, so you will be absolutely sure that the formulas are correct. Uh, plus, there is a prerequisite course called Mass for Teens. Mass is a man ma mandatory course for, uh, for the physics, um, and uh, especially calculus, uh, vector algebra, and uh, some other aspects. Um, complex numbers. By the way, today we will actually talk about complex numbers as well. Okay, so I have two problems. The first problem is related to a lecture. Uh, where I was deriving a formula for oscillation of if you have something like this um, you have a spring with an object spring her, uh, uh, has certain characteristics like uh, elasticity for instance uh, this object has mass obviously um, so uh, that's basically enough to describe the oscillations um, uh, outside of any influence, any force. But now there is a force, actually, which is periodic. It's like, basically, you have something like a swing, and you are pushing the swing with certain um, period, cer certain periodicity. So this is angular um, speed, sometimes it's called angular fre frequency, uh, and uh, obviously the, um, its own oscillations, natural oscillations, without the force. Um, as I was explained in one of the lectures, was with angular, um, uh, angular speed equals to k over m square root. Now, this is all derived previously, and in the lecture I'm um, referring to right now, I, I actually derived the oscillation of this object as a formula, as a function of time, from if this is some neutral position, and x of t is deviation from the neutral position, and the spring can go both ways. Uh, either stretching or squeezing by itself and obviously there is a, a force which is also involved and then I have derived this formula which I will put here F0 divided by M omega 0 square minus omega square cosine omega t <coughs> plus d cosine omega zero t minus phi. Okay, so don't get scared. I mean, if you have just got to this lecture, um, and I'm not going to explain where I got this formula from, go to the, uh, the lecture which is called uh, forced oscillations. Uh, I think it's forced oscillations number one, because there are two, uh, two of them where this formula is derived properly without any kind of shortcuts. So I'm using it as is to basically describe the problem which I have. Now the F0 is this coefficient. Now what are d and phi? These are defined by initial conditions because the uh, spring can be initially stretched to certain distance or um, the object can be pushed to give it certain um, speed initially. So these initial conditions are defined. For instance, in this particular case, since we have this force involved, we can actually start from um, initial position at zero, at neutral point, and initial speed at, at zero. And then the force will basically start acting, 
and the whole system will start oscillating. Now my question is, if I did not have this, that's the periodic function, that's the cosine. If I don't have the force, the its own uh, oscillations are also periodic because there is a cosine here. My question is, is the sum of these, the um, oscillation which is based on both its own properties and the properties of the force, are these oscillations periodic? That's a very important question. So, that's my first problem. <laughs> are these movements represent a periodic uh, oscillations? Okay, so first of all you have to basically think yourself, you can uh, pause the video and just think about this um, yourself. Um, now, how can I um, basically answer this question? Well, what's important is, let's forget about the details, what's important is this and this. So, the periodicity of this, T1, is equal to 2 pi over omega. If omega is angular speed, which means how many radians per second, then the period is obviously supposed to be 2 pi. T period means when the full cycle actually is done. So, full cycle is 2 pi. If you divide it by distance divided by speed, you will get the time. So, this is the time when the whole period 2 pi will actually come into play. Because without the omega, the cosine t has the period 2 pi. But with omega, it has 2 pi over omega. That's obvious. Now, that's one period. That's the periodicity of this member. Now, the periodicity of this member is 2 pi over omega 0. So, my question is, when the sum of these will be repeating itself. So, this component repeats itself after this amount of time. This component repeats itself after this amount of time. Now, if I will uh, come up with certain um, amount of time, which is multiple of this, and multiple of this, then the sum would actually be uh, of this function. Then this, uh, this, this period, which is multiple of this and multiple of this, will actually be the periodicity of the sum of these. Because if, for instance, I have certain t, which is equal a times t1 and b times t2, where a and b are integer numbers. So after the t time, which is after a times t1, this will repeat its own value. But at the same time, this is an integer number of t2, so this one will repeat its value, which means their sum will also repeat its value. So all I have to do is to find such a period, which is a multiple of this and multiple of this, of this and of this. Well, this is not always possible, because if you will convert this thing, it will be t1 divided by t2 is equal to b over a, where b and a are integer uh, numbers, which means this ratio is supposed to be a rational number, the result of dividing integer by integer. If it's irrational number, which is possible, I mean, you don't. These omega and omega zero are completely independent um, angular speeds, so they they are not necessarily um, uh, their ratio is not necessarily a rational number. It can be irrational. For instance, this can be uh, uh, pi, and this can be twenty-seven. Obviously, their ratio is irrational. Their ratio is irrational. In which case, there will be no such period, which is a multiple of this and multiple of that. So, 
the example which I have presented in the lecture where I derived this formula. I was actually using 2 and 5. And 2 and 5, obviously the ratio 2 fifths is a rational number, and the graph which was presented in, in that lecture uh, represented actually the periodicity. It was not like a smooth sinusoidal, it was something like this. But it's still a peri uh, per 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 periodic function, because if you will start from here to here, this piece is repeated itself. So, the answer is, if the angular speed of its own oscillations of this spring with this mass uh, is such uh, that it's in a ratio, rational ratio, with uh, frequencies between this and this and their frequency, their ratio is actually equal to ratio of um, uh, angular speeds because 2 pi obviously is cancelling out so this is the same as omega 0 divided by omega so if this is a rational number then you can expect the periodicity of the um, oscillations. If not, this thing will not be periodic. I mean, one of the pieces maybe will be stretching, then uh, make, make it a little smaller, and then maybe stretch to another. It will be more chaotic, let's put it this way. It will be much more chaotic. If this ratio is an irrational number, it will be, uh, it will be much more chaotic. That's it for the first problem. Now my second problem. My second problem is, it's kind of a summary of whatever it was before. So it's like a lecture, but I present it as a problem. Um, now we discussed how the oscillations um, are happening just by themselves, without any external force. Then we introduced the concept of a friction. So what happens with oscillation if there is a friction, which is not part of this particular problem. Then we were discussing in another lecture the concept of viscosity, when there is some kind of a resistance uh, to a movement proportional uh, to the speed. It's like you are making certain oscillations inside the water. If you're moving slowly, it doesn't really present much of a resistance, but this, the, 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 the faster you go, the faster the oscillations are, the stronger resistance of the water will be. That's what viscosity actually is all about. And then we were discussing what happens if there is some kind of an external periodic force, like with a swing. Now, what this problem is, it's a combination. So what happens if you have a spring, you have a viscosity of the environment where the oscillations are happening, and you have the external force. So it's like a combination of, um, of uh, all the previously considered cases, okay? So let's do it uh, step by step. So let's say you have elasticity, you have mass, you need a viscosity. Now, what is viscosity? The, uh, uh, function uh, which is the result of this resistance of the environment, viscous, vis viscous resistance, it's supposed to be proportional to a speed, right? And the coefficient of proportionality, I call it c, and the speed is the first derivative of the displacement from the neutral position. So we're assuming that 
we are along x-axis. This is at zero, in initial position zero. Well, let's just assume that the uh, position is zero and the speed initial is also zero. It's the external force which starts the oscillations. But I have to put minus sign, because if the speed is in one direction, the resistance, the force, is resisting, which means it's directly opposite. So that's why there is a minus sign. Same thing, very analogously, to a spring, um, to the force of the spring. The force of the spring is dependent, according to the Hooke's law, it, 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 dep it depends on the displacement, how far we stretch. The farther we stretch, the stronger the force. But again, if we stretch to a positive direction, the force will be um, uh, directed negatively. And the coefficient of proportion proportionality is elasticity. And it depends on the position. So that's the second force which acts on the object. Now, the third force, <laughs> that's this one, external force. Call it Fx, external. So that's F0 times cosine omega t, where omega is a given um, angular speed. So all these three forces are acting at the same time. Now, my problem is derive the um, equation of motion and solve it. Um, now, I will derive equation of motion and I will talk about how to solve it. The complete solution is in the notes, because it's kind of lengthy and uh, most likely I will make a mistake if I will start reproducing it again uh, at the board. So I would refer you, after this lecture, I would refer you to the notes to see exactly all these calculations in all their small detail. Okay, so first we have to come up with a, an equation of motion. Now, it's based on Newton's second law, which says that mass times acceleration, well, instead of acceleration, usually it's letter A, but I will use the second derivative of the displacement, right? The first derivative is speed, and the second derivative is acceleration. So this is supposed to be equal to the total of all the forces acting on this um, object which means it's equal to minus Cx first derivative minus K function and plus F0 cosine omega t. Now, what is this? Well, it's a differential equation of the second order now, it's not uh, homogeneous, because homogeneous is, if you didn't have this member, it would be homogeneous, which means if you found function uh, x of t, then the function x of t multiplied by any number would also be a solution. So without this, if x of t is solution, and we multiply x of t by, by, by some constant, Obviously, this constant will be multiplied here, here, and here, and the uh, function multiplied by a constant will, al will also be a solution. So, how to solve these non-homogeneous equation if, if a simple function can be just removed from it and it would be homogeneous? Well, I did address this before, and I'll just basically repeat the whole thing. Here is how we will do it. Now, this is a repetition. It was in one of the lectures before. First of all, let's just um, change this to this. I will put all x-related things here. Okay. 
So I put all the x related things to the left and divided by the this coefficient, so I have coefficient one at at the second derivative, so it's that's why it's divided by m. So this is my differential equation. Now let's assume that there is a function which is a solution to this. Let's call it x1. And then there is an x2, which is also a solution. So we have two different functions. What if I will subtract one from another? Well, if uh, uh, this, the, the first and the second uh, uh, derivatives are linear, so derivative of a sum is equal to sum of the derivatives, or a difference between functions, right? So if I will subtract x1 and x2, which is equal to the same thing, this will cancel out, right? And I will have x1 minus x2, second, deri uh, second derivative, then uh, c over m, uh, the first derivative of the difference between function, and uh, and then the the functions themselves, that would be equal to zero, which is a homogeneous equation, which means that the difference between two uh, solutions to non-homogeneous equation, the difference between two different solutions, is a solution to a homogeneous equation. So, from this follows the following. To get all the different solutions for a non-homogeneous equation, we can have only one of them particular solution to non-homogeneous equation. And then add all the homogeneous equation, I mean all the solutions to a homogeneous equation. So, if this is fine, uh, I'll continue. If not, you can just stop here, and I would refer you to the first lecture, actually, about forced oscillations, uh, where I ex explain it again, and uh, it's basically in writing as well. And it's in the notes for this lecture as well. So again, to solve the non-homogeneous equation, it's sufficiently to solve completely homogeneous equation when it's equal to zero. And all the solutions of these can be added to one particular solution of this to get all solutions to non-homogeneous equation. Okay. Now, so we have two problems. Number one, number one problem is solve homogeneous equation. Number two is in, in its totality, which means to get all the solutions to a, a homogeneous equation. And the second problem is find just one particular solution to a non-homogeneous when there is this function on the right. So with a zero it's a com homogeneous, with, no with a function it's non-homogeneous. So we will try to find all the solutions of homogeneous equation when it's equal to zero, and then uh, try to find a particular solution to a non-homogeneous. So if I have a homogeneous equation, How can I solve it? Well, people obviously did think about this, and they have, you know, come up with certain very good results. Well, first of all, this is homogeneous, it's linear uh, of the second uh, degree, because there is a second derivative here. Now, um, uh, first of all, people have proven that it's enough to find two different functions and the linear combination of these functions would represent all linear combinations would represent all the solutions to this particular equation again we did address this before uh, it's basically proven uh, in, in mathematics um, you can just take it as given or you can just go into the differential equations theory and basically get it from there so if there is such an equation, so all the solutions can be basically obtained from two particular solutions by combining them in all the different linear combinations. Why two? Because it's the second degree. If it was a third degree, we would need three independent uh, solutions, etc. Now, when I'm saying independent, it means that 
one solution should not be a multiple of another solution, because that would be obviously only one, because we are edging all the linear combinations, so we will not have a multiplicity of, re of solutions. And how can I find two independent solutions? That's easy, actually, because I will do the following. I will assume this. Let me see. Maybe this may be a solution. Now, why am I, you know, so smart to, to suggest it? For a very simple reason. Because the first derivative of x is gamma times e to the gamma t. And the second derivative is gamma square gamma t. And if I will substitute it here, I will have this multiplier here, here, here. And this is zero, so I will just cancel it out. And what will remain? It will remain gamma square plus c over m gamma plus k over m equals to zero. Right? So if I will put this, this, and this into this equation, my e to the gamma t would just be here, here, and here. I will just cancel it out because it's never equal to zero, as we know. e to the power of gamma t, for any gamma m t, this is not um, uh, not zero. So I just d d uh, I just cancel it out, I divide everything by this, and I have a quadratic equation. And now, by solving this quadratic equation, I will get two different roots uh, for gamma, and that would represent two different functions and combination, linear combination of these two different functions, one of them would be e to the power of gamma 1t, where gamma 1 is a 1 solution, x2 of t would be e to the power of gamma 2t, and then any linear combination of them where a and b are any numbers would be a solution and that would actually constitute all the solution, solutions to this quadratic, uh, to this second order uh, differential equation. So, how to do this? Again, it's just quadratic equation. I'm not going into all these calculations. Uh, they are presented in the notes for this lecture. Uh, and again, that's kind of a trivial thing which I'm not going to spend any time in front of the board. So, we have found a general solution to a homogeneous equation. There is one little detail here. You see, this is not necessarily two independent solutions, because sometimes uh, you might have the same um, solution, it's like a, I don't remember how it's called, when two roots of this quadratic differential equation are exactly the same. For instance, if you, if you have something like x squared is equal to 4, uh, no, sorry, is equal to 0, for instance, then you have x0 and x0. You, you don't have more than one um, equations. So if this is the full square, maybe x minus 4 squared is equal to 0, which is x squared minus 8x plus 16. Now this is also has only one solution, 4. So it's like a double root. Now in this case, I will not have two independent solutions and they have to resort to something else. And I did actually explain how to deal with this in the lecture uh, related to free oscillations, the first lecture about free oscillations. Here, just for simplifying my, 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 my work, I would just assume that C is small enough to let the oscillations happening. Now, why C is supposed to be small enough? C is a viscosity. If viscosity is very high, and then I, let's say, push my object from the equilibrium 
I stretched a little bit using the force. Well, it will go, then it might actually start going back very slowly, and it might not even reach back the, uh, the neutral point. It will just be slowly approaching and never going above it, and never actually oscillating. With a small c, oscillations will happen with a small viscosity. So let's assume that viscosity is small enough, and if it's small enough, then c over m squared minus uh, uh, 4k over m, which is a discriminant of this, would be negative. And if it's negative, I will have two complex roots, and from the complex roots I will have um, sine and cosine, basically. And again, I did explain it in more details in, in the notes, where the exact solutions are actually presented. So, this is how we solve the general um, uh, how, how we get the general solution to homogeneous equation. Fine, that's done. Here it is, and x1 and x2 can be found from here. Gamma1 and gamma2 are complex numbers because this is negative, but from these complex numbers we are getting only the real part. Um, again, you remember probably the formula, the e uh, Euler's formula about um, what is actually e to the power of i x? That's I, I, my my calculations depend on it. So again, that's another thing you need to know complex numbers from the mass. Okay. Now let's go to the second problem. Second problem is how to solve, how to get one particular solution to non-homogeneous equation, which is written here. Now, to find this non-homogeneous, to, to solve this non-homogeneous equation, I also have to basically assume something about x of t, and maybe I will be, you know, smart enough or lucky enough to, to get a, a solution to this thing. All right, so... It, I, I, the, I, the idea here is is basically exactly the same. Um, what we have to do is we have to find some kind of a expression, some kind of a uh, formula for x of t, maybe with certain parameters, and try, maybe, I will be able to manipulate this formula in some way with parameters to satisfy this equation. And the way how um, I'm just thinking about approaching it, you see, this is a cosine. Now, you know, this, the derivative of sine is a cosine, derivative of a cosine is a minus sine. So I think it's reasonable to attempt to search for a particular solution in the form Okay, let me try. Maybe with certain a and b, this function would be a solution to this equation. Now, why? Well, again, again because this is cosine and sine. This is uh, the first derivative. From the cosine, it's a sine. From the sine, it's a cosine. From this, it's also second derivative. So it's all sines and cosines and nothing more. And maybe with these coefficients, I will be able to make this an identity. It's reasonable, so let's try. So the first derivative of this function is derivative of cosine is minus sine, so it's minus a, and then would be a derivative of insert, uh, internal function, and that's my derivative of this. Derivative of this would be b Derivative of a, of a sine is a cosine, but then there is an inner function, so also omega. 
cosine omega t. Second derivative. Derivative of this minus remains uh, omega remains from the cosine. It's a um, wait a moment. Wait a minute. This is supposed to be sine. It's my mistake. Sorry. From the sine derivative is a cosine and another inner function, so it would be squared here. Here, from a cosine, it's minus, so it's minus b omega sine of omega t and inner function, so that would be square. Okay, so as you see now, we have to uh, substitute these three into this and I will have sines and cosines with different coefficients. Now, obviously, if I have something with sines and cosines, my and I and it's supposed to be identity, so all the coefficients from this related to cosine, which is this, this, and this, must be equal to F0 over M. So A plus b double uh, omega minus a omega square that's the cosine right if i will but this should be multiply my first derivative it's supposed to multiply by c over m so it's c divided by m here and my second my 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 free member should be multiplied by k over m and my second derivative is without any multiplier. So this is all coefficients at cosine. And it's supposed to be equal to F0 over M. Now, sine. There is no sine here. So sine here should be equal to 0. So it's again, it's B. But I have to multiply it by K over M. Uh, here minus a but that's c over m a omega and uh, second derivative without so it's minus b omega square and that's supposed to be equal to zero because there is no sign here now this is a system of two equations with linear equations with two uh, uh, unknown a and b very easy to, to 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 solve i mean it's just lots of calculations basically but it's simple it's tedious but it's simple and that's how i can get a and b now getting a and b it means i have got one particular solution for my equation now having this particular solution and having a general solution to a homogeneous equation with uh, uh, oscillations without the force but in the viscose um, environment. Knowing both of these solutions, I'll just add one solution which I have found, this concrete one, and the general solution, uh, let me just write the formulas for you, and the general solution which I have found for um, damped calculation, uh, damped oscillations in the viscose uh, environment. And I will get an interesting formula. I will get x of t is equal to a particular solution which I have found, a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t that's which i have just found from these um uh, system of linear two linear equations for a and b plus general solution to um damped calculation uh, damped oscillations e minus c t over 2 m cosine of omega 0 t minus phi 
Well, that's not much. Instead of zero, I will put homogeneous, which has its own formula. <coughs> so this part, this, repre this part represents um, the oscillation in the uh, viscose environment. Important thing is here. So it's kind of um, periodic. I should put internal. It's kind of periodic because there is a cosine. But the amplitude is diminishing as the t grows because of this exponential multiplier. So the graph of this thing would be so instead of plain cosine, plain cosine is this with equal lengths. Now this multiplied by this, that would be a different picture. That would be this picture. It will be diminishing amplitude. And this represents damped oscillations inside the viscose environment. Now this represents the uh, results of oscillations based on the force, external force. And what, you and what you see here is that it's a sum of these and this component is getting less and less and less. And this is basically periodic with a uh, periodicity of uh, omega, uh, well, 2 pi over omega, and that remains basically a relatively periodic uh, movement. So, on this periodic movement related to the force, we basically superpose the additional oscillations because of the system has its own spring, its own um, characteristics. But this part is getting smaller and smaller. So if I will add to this, I will add something like this. I don't know how to put it. Let's say this. The result of this would be some kind of a chaotic movement in the beginning. But then less and less it would be chaotic and it would be more and more like a plain sinusoid because of this part. And that's very important. In the environment which has no viscosity, and that was the subject of lecture about force oscillations number one, we, would, m we might have the periodic movement if my ratio, that's the first problem which I have presented today, if my ratio between the uh, frequencies of its own oscillations and the uh, uh, the oscillations of the force are in rational uh, ratio, rational ratio, <laughs> um, if their ratio is a rational number. Um, uh, but in any case, it will be basically all the time, both components will be important, even if it's not periodic, but the component related to its own oscillations would participate in the movement, in this pseudo-chaotic movement. And the periodicity of this function will also have a picture. If we are dealing with a viscose environment, which basically slows down the, its own natural oscillations, but the force, outside force, remains the same. So eventually, its outside force will play the most important role. And the role of its own spring would be actually less and less um, effective. Okay, now let me just refer you again to notes. In this particular case, it's important because there were a lot of calculations. I could not present all of them uh, on the board in one lecture. So I put everything in writing, and I do suggest you to go to this lecture, which means you go to unisor.com. Course is called Physics for Teens. Then um, the part is waves. And inside the waves part, there are many different kinds of waves, oscillations. This is the mechanical oscillations, problem number four. So, the notes for this lecture 
um, are much more detailed than I have presented here, um, just because of the lack of time and uh, again most likely I would make a mistake. But the notes are correct, I checked them out, so I do suggest you to read them. That's it, thank you very much and good luck.